shared so far. But this is not, this is just a brief, really, of part of what has happened to FHA. A lot of what has happened to FHA remains buried in the womb of time. However, it seems that this anniversary should be an opportunity not only to look backwards, but also to look forward. And as we sit here today, ask ourselves what the next 50 years holds in stock for the FHG. Honestly, I do not know the answer, but I am certain that time will tell. In 50 years' time, maybe General Gowon will still be here. Time will tell. And in order for time to tell positive things about FHA in 50 years from now and beyond, I will venture to make some suggestions. My suggestions will be in areas like financing, housing types, affordability, people participation, and maintenance, just to mention a few. So let me begin on the financing front. And I want to start by commending the supervising ministry of FHA, that is the Ministry of Housing and Urban Development. And I also want to commend my immediate successor, the Honorable Minister, Dr. Dangiwa and his colleague, the Honorable Minister of State, for the theme that I saw that they have chosen for the recent 12th meeting of the National Council on Housing and Urban Development. That theme was, quote, harnessing local international credit schemes as a panacea for housing infrastructure development under the Renew Hope Agenda. I commend them because, in my view, the choice of the team demonstrates a consciousness about one of the problems in the housing delivery area which is how do we pay for the construction of housing in a sustainable way? It's a big question. We have heard from the managing director, without controversial from the National Assembly, that the house FHA is not being funded from the federal budget. So where is FHA supposed to get money? So I therefore not only hope, but I also expect that there will be a deliberate follow-up on the theme of this National Council with the objective of ensuring that commensurate and substantial funding is available for housing delivery generally in the Nigerian political landscape and particularly to FHA. As far as FHA is concerned, I will repeat here publicly the advice I gave to them when I was their supervising minister about some of the ways that they can raise money. And the story is simple, and I'm glad to see that some of the first steps have started to be taken in digitizing their records and their, and their titles. So, FHA holds vast and massive tracts of land across the country. And for those who are in real estate development, if you have land, you are sitting on money. And my advice to them was, look, go and title all this land if you don't have titles, value them, and create an asset base that can take you to the capital market. And you can leverage your assets in order to raise credit. So I repeat that advice publicly. And let me be clear, I am not suggesting the disposal of these assets for cash. I am suggesting that they can become a treasure tool of assets upon which security can be taken by a financial institution to leverage cash for FHA to go and uh, build. But 
building is only half of the problem. FHA must then be able to sell the houses, recover its investment, and hopefully make some profit so that it can pay off what it has borrowed. Otherwise, it will lose all of those assets. Now, and this is where the rubber meets the road. Because almost on a regular basis now, on our television screens, on our radio speakers, we hear about one private developer or the other doing exactly what I am suggesting. And they are clearly doing it for profit. And these people have bought land at open market rates and at competitive rates. So if they are making progress, what stops FHA from competing and being the biggest player in that commercial space? I think that this would be, I dare say, a very painful process that FHA must undertake. And it must start from within, and I'm glad we have seen some of the evidence already. It will also require FHA to get, in my view, some external professional support but it is something which I believe can be done. So, the only thing in my view that stops FHA from going that way successfully, the only ob obstacle is FHA itself. If the will is there, there will be a way. Of course, we all know that FHA can build. We have seen all of what they have built. We have seen Festa, we have seen Guarimpa, we have seen Zuba. And I'm aware that there is work that has been done also in places like Guzapé, and work is going on, I think, in Buari and other estates. The question is, can FHA successfully sell? Hello? Can FHA that can build, can they successfully sell? <laughs> And this leads to very, very serious questions of corporate governance. And the role of public officers, like many of us here, and the in the acquisition of FHA houses on the one hand. So we're going to ask all the past MDs, and even the current MDs, and the past chairmen and the board, the kind of pressure they have faced when they build houses and public officers expect to take those houses and I mean take in the real sense so that's why I'm asking can FHA sell? because if FHA goes to the capital market to raise money and public officers won't subsidize housing you know that there is a mismatch the books will not match and this is why I'm talking of serious corporate governance. And that is why I say it will be a painful process. And I'm happy that both arms of the government are here to listen and decide whether this is the way they want to go. But that is one side of the sale. And that's a small side. I think that we can correct or we can manage. The other side of the sale that I want to talk about, it is that FHA must not now just go out to build anymore. FHA has to ask the market what the market wants. Otherwise, FHA will not be able to sell, no matter how well built. So, surveys must be done. And I think that the focal group that FHA wants to start building for now is certainly not General Gowan or myself or Governor Tambua or the minister himself or the honorable member who is chairman of the housing committee, Honorable Valeri. FHA is not building for us. FHA will be building for the generation that has the biggest demand now people in their 20s and 30s. 
And I think that FHA must consciously now go out and conduct surveys to ask them what kind of house they want. That generation is not building five bedroom and suite house anymore. They need small spaces, they need work spaces, they need gyms, they need those kind of things, they need Wi-Fi enabled environment. So if you build what they will not buy, you will be unable to sell. So that's my other advice. Of course, I also advise that we ask them how they want to pay before we build before we commit monies that FHA may have raised. Because these are critical to sustainability. And so when I asked whether FHA can sell, this was where I was going. And I'm sure those of you who were quick to say yes are now pausing to reflect. Because there are so, there are significant number of houses in Abuja, in many cities of Nigeria, that are there empty and unoccupied. The builders have not been able to sell. There's something that is wrong that those houses are not connecting to the market. So before I leave housing time, let me just suggest to uh, FHA that I am happy we are going digital because that is the space to also communicate with your largest market the 25s and the 30s because they are living and working in the digital space. So if you expect them to come to your head office to come and collect application form, you are not talking to them. They will come home. All the advance must be done online in the space where they operate. All the forms must be online in the space where they operate. So this is the FHA going into the next 50 years. And as I said, time will tell. Uh, there are a lot of young people now who are renting properties, but they are also property owners. You know what they are doing with their property? They are buying small, small properties and letting it out as Airbnb. These are areas, again, that FHA may want to look into. That is the future. That is the market. So, of course, Ability to sell is also a question of affordability. And the debate about affordability will continue to rage. But two things impact affordability. And as I say, affordability is not a one-way street. It's a two-way street. How much did it cost to build the house? And how much are you asking me to pay for it? <laughs> So in one way, through research and development, we can bring innovation into housing types, housing costs, and bring down costs. But the cheapest house may still be unaffordable for the person it was built for, if you ask him to pay at once. While the most expensive house may be affordable for the person it was built for, because he can get a 15-year mortgage. So let us not be in doubt about what the challenges ahead look like. And therefore, I am recommending that in my time as governor in Lagos, we started a housing program that was putting 200 flats on the market in Lagos every month. It was putting it out at a 10-year mortgage of a single-digit interest rate. And throughout the period we ran that thing, the last three years of my administration, we had no issue of affordability because people were paying through mortgage. It is something you want to look at and it is something you want to improve upon. Of course, also, in the period that I was Minister of Housing, we undertook a national housing program and we offered it to members of the public built in 35 states by asking the Federal Mortgage Bank to also provide mortgage finance. And I don't recall that we had any serious issue of affordability because of the way people were asked to pay. So, 
I think that the FHA and the minister can review what we have done and seek to improve upon it because they were not perfect, but they provided some response. Now, on the issue of affordability before I leave it, let me talk about rent. Because we have discussed our national housing issues largely on the basis of ownership. But the truth, if we are honest with ourselves, is that not everybody can afford to buy a house. That's just the honest truth. There is no country in the world that I know where everybody owns a home. But as many people get sheltered because of a rent policy. And so I'm just going to urge the ministry, the National Assembly to focus more on this rental side. Unfortunately, it is not a federal responsibility because rent is a state matter. But I think by the collaborations that exist at the National Council, collaborations that exist between the National Assembly and the State Assemblies, I think there is a scope to intervene in rent. And if we can do it, I think that it will be perhaps the biggest thing that our country has done for working class people in a long time. Pardon me to take one minute just to dramatize how serious rent is. Have you watched movies in whatever language, our home movies? Now, if the operators of that light can put that light off, please. The ones you just switched on now. Thank you very much. Have you watched home movies where the landlord comes knocking on the door and the parents will push their children out to go and say, go and tell landlord that I'm not at home. Does that resonate? It speaks to a very big problem. Very big problem. Parents are supposed to teach children to tell the truth. They are supposed to teach them the right values. But when the landlord is coming and the parents don't have money, they say, go and say I'm not at home. If we don't understand that there is a problem, then we have a problem. I understood it as governor. We intervened in Lagos. And it provided some relief. But there's more that can be done. And for me, I think that this is where state legislators can help to converge payment of rent with the receipt of wages. Because if you ask people to go and bring two years rent in advance from salaries that they are going to earn monthly in arrears and they bring it and we accept it and we don't think that something is wrong, the joke is on us. The system will pay for it as it has done to our collective pay. Rent payment is one of the biggest credits that the rest of the world gives to their citizens. You live in the house on credit until the end of the week or until the end of the month. When your income comes, then you pay. Should I continue? I think the message is clear. So I am going to anchor that argument to one of the economic policy thrusts of President Tinobu when he was campaigning. He wanted to open our economy to credit. When he was addressing the business community in Lagos and in other places, he was telling them that why should people go and be paying cash for a car, go and be paying cash for a television, when in other countries they get credit and pay slowly. He has pushed that credit agenda into education by saying that students who cannot afford it can take a loan in order to go to school. I think this meeting here today 
our meeting here today gives us a very, very big opportunity. Honorable Minister of Housing and Urban Development and Honorable Minister of State, it's a very big opportunity to expand the President's credit system, credit policy into housing, working with the National Assembly and working with state governments and state legislators. If we do that, to about FHS. Happy anniversary. Red and TV, first hand real estate channel.